Our topic is gun violence, who should pay? The um, National Rifle Association has, I think you could say in a way, has tried to make the topic illegitimate. A few weeks ago, as you may have read in the paper, uh, a nominee to the um, Federal Circuit Court for the District of Columbia was successfully blocked by, you know, the kind of nominal filibuster they do now, uh, was successfully blocked because she had had the temerity to represent the state of New York years earlier when, the, when New York State sued gun manufacturers. That apparently alone was sufficient reason to block her nomination to the circuit court when she was doing her job as, a, as an assistant to the attorney general. You talk about what's on the table for discussion. Right now in Washington, it seems that holding gun manufacturers accountable is so far off the table that almost nobody is talking about it, of course, with the honorable exception of some of our panelists. But that's politics. That's not substance. The, I would say, and I, I, I think I'm safe in saying this, that of the various efforts to, um, to impose liability on gun manufacturers, of, of, of all the different ways to reduce gun violence, these efforts impact, encroach, the least on the Second Amendment. Now, the NRA, in, as I read it, truly primarily represents the gun manufacturers who, who fund it more really than gun owners, I would say. And the, the NRA, though, hates these efforts, naturally, holding gun manufacturers accountable, more than they hate the other efforts. I have personal evidence of that, which I could tell you at some point if you want. But I if the Second Amendment had read, the right of the people to sell arms shall not be infringed, then maybe they'd have a more plausible case. But from a substantive point of view, holding gun manufacturers account accountable certainly deserves to be in the heart of the conversation, not off the table, not regarded as an extreme position, but substantive, substantively very much in the middle of the conversation. And it will indeed be the heart of our conversation here tonight at John Jay. Our hope, of course, is that we will move it from here to the national conversation. And with that, let me introduce our speakers. Our first speaker will be Elizabeth Holtzman. Um, I am a little reluctant to use the number, but it's true that almost 25 years ago, uh, Liz Holtzman asked me to urge me to introduce legislation to impose strict tort liability on handgun manufacturers under certain circumstances. As a pathbreaking member of Congress for eight years and the only woman ever elected Brooklyn DA and comptroller of the city of New York, her role in public life has been extraordinary. In those public positions, and even in the past 20 years in private practice, her dedication to the public interest has been second to none. David Yasky, who is sitting right next to Liz, is now the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commissioner, and he is not here to talk about taxis and limousines, I hope, right? As a member of any questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, as a member of New he was, however, a member of New York City Council, and in that capacity a number of years ago, he introduced the local New York City law, one of the very few, was it the only one, David? But certainly one of the very, very few that in its in its own terms at the time actually imposed strict liability on handgun manufacturers. Sitting next to David is uh, Michael Cardoza, who's the Corporation Counsel for the City of New York. And Mr. Cardoza, on behalf of our city, has actually sued gun sellers with some, although mixed, but some success, uh, ably aided by, where'd Eric go? There, by Eric Prashansky over there, who is uh, the Deputy Chief of the Division of Affirmative Litigation in the Corp Council. Um, Mr. Cardozo is an extremely well-respected attorney in private practice previously before he came to his current position. Uh, among other civic contributions, among I should say many other civic contributions, he w served as uh, uh, president of the New York City Bar Association, uh, which is a very important and uh, meritorious organization in our town. Um, Jonathan Lowy, next seat, is um, director of the Legal Action Process Program of the Brady Center pr to Prevent Gun Violence, which I think I can safely say is the leading organization in the country on, uh, on uh, handgun li uh, gun violence litigation. Um, and John continues to sue gun manufacturers and, and fight the battle against gun violence full time. He has also won some notable victories and continues to give hope to us all. Finally, last but not least, we have U.S. Representative Adam Schiff, who's in his seventh term representing California's 28th Congressional District. He does a lot of very important things, but what brought him here tonight is his introduction two months ago, right, 
two months ago, of the Access to Justice for Victims of Gun Violence Act. He has courageously taken to the gun lobby the fight that infuriates them the most. In 2003, Congress first passed something called the TR Amendment, and in 2005, the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, two statutes that attempt to make gun makers the only manufacturers in the United States who are immune from lawsuits for negligence and nuisance two of the most unconscionable pieces of legislation imaginable. Representative Schiff's bill would repeal those laws. With that, let me introduce our first speaker, Congress, former Congresswoman and DA and Comptroller, Elizabeth Holtzman. Thanks so much, Dan. Uh, I'm very honored that you asked me to be here. I, I actually don't know why I'm here, because these people on the panel have done such an outstanding job in the area of gun violence. Um, I, I'm personally awed. So, and you should be too. They are really outstanding, and they're at the forefront, and what they're doing is protecting the lives and safety of Americans. So we are deeply grateful to you, and also want to compliment Michael Cardozo, your boss for his extraordinary efforts in this regard. Um, let me just start by saying that uh, my, uh, um, my encounter for the first time with the NRA, to give you an idea of what we're talking about here, was when I was on the House Judiciary Committee, it was in the late 70s, and there was a bill that came through the Judiciary Committee to put uh, identifying markers in gunpowder so that if terrorists use the gunpowder to create bombs, the FBI, the, A, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Agency, other law enforcement agencies could identify the bomber. We're talking about mass murder. We're talking about bombs. The NRA came and said, mm-mm, this is no good because this will interfere with the right, I don't know if they said infringe on the constitutional right, but it was close to that, of um, people who wanted to roll their own bullets. So terrorists won, and potential victims of mass murder and of terrorism lost. That was my first encounter, and I said, this is not a good sign, because this is not a group that has any interest of the safety of the American people. Well, we have now seen the consequences of the NRA's efforts, both in Congress to water down um, and to, uh, to water down uh, federal regulation. Uh, you can't have public health. The Centers for, for uh, Disease Control can't do public health ex uh, studies, for example, on gun violence, just to give you an idea. Consumer Product Safety Commission can't regulate guns. They can regulate all other kinds of consumer products. So the NRA has in every single area they can figure out, whether it's rolling your own bullets or stopping a scientific investigation or watering down regulatory statutes, they are out in front, and the consequences are huge. We, we see them, of course, we see them in most dramatically in the mass murders and the mass killings that, take, that have taken place and are continuing to take place, whether it's of children or older people, whether it's in schools or movie theaters. But just the daily, daily drumbeat of deaths by guns is staggering in this country. We have one of the worst rates in the entire world. And yet, assault rifles can be sold, even though they have one purpose, which is to kill a human being. You don't hunt with an assault rifle. And uh, this is where we are. So I, I'm really glad that, Dan, you brought us together to try to figure out what steps can be taken uh, legally to combat this violence, 
to bring some sense of order and sanity and justice to the to um, to the uh, gun to the distribution of guns in the United States and um, to try to protect the public safety and public welfare. As controller, as Dan mentioned, in 1991, uh, I, I introduced or legislation or got legislation introduced on my behalf in the city council to hold gun manufacturers strictly liable for the damage caused by the guns that they were distributing improperly. Now you might say, <laughs> why should the gun manufacturer be liable? I mean, the gun manufacturer sells guns, the guns work, some criminal comes and takes the gun and shoots people, why should the gun manufacturer be held liable? Well, to me, it made sense from a variety of reasons, and we could explore that uh, at some length in the question period, but first of all, guns are inherently dangerous. Secondly, many of these guns are not distributed legally. Many, many guns can be traced, or many of the criminal guns that are sold criminally can be traced to a relatively small number of dealers in this country. Third, who should bear the costs of the devastation, the bill, more than a billion dollars is estimated the cost of gun violence in America every year, probably more than that. Tens of thousands of Americans die from guns. I mean, the personal loss, the public health loss, the, the monetary loss is huge. Who should bear that loss? The manufacturers who put these guns in the stream of commerce and profit and don't pay any attention to how these guns are sold. In fact, the more the merrier. Or the people who lose loved ones the people who are injured fatally or the people who become uh, seriously injured as a result, who should bear the costs? In my view, the cost should be shifted to the gun manufacturers who are profiting and failing to take care sufficiently. So my view is that that still should be done. Courts have tried to, as I mentioned, weaken um, <clears throat> whatever, the laws in existence, Congress passed this uh, protection, um, this, this act that is, tries to stop what I tried to do, which was to get lawsuits brought against gun manufacturers and try to develop the law in the area of how to hold gun manufacturers liable and let the courts deal with this over time in different states in different ways. And that's been watered down. There's some loopholes in that law that are being exploited. But every effort has to be made to litigate under that statute and to try to find and expand whatever loopholes there are so that gun manufacturers can be held liable and so that we can restrain to the po maximum extent possible this explosion of weapons in the United States, which are used for murder and, and to kill. And secondly, we need to figure out other ways of acting, whether it's changing existing statutes, whether it's nuisance statutes or other kinds of statutes to comply with these rules, that can be done on a state level, whether it's to bring, bring public pressure to bear. I mean, for example, when I was DA, one of the worst things I used to see were the crime reports of children who would find a gun in the house, a three-year-old would pull out the gun and shoot the five-year-old, or the five-year-old would shoot the three-year-old. Parents had a gun, the kids knew where the guns were, they took them out and shot them. Gun manufacturers can easily have devices put on guns that would prevent that from happening. They're not doing it. There'd be efforts to try to shame them, to do something about this. Children lose their lives needlessly, so there are actions that need to be confronted and looked at and explored at every level, whether it's publicity, whether it's litigation, whether it's revising statutes. So I, I hope that with the uh, wisdom and um, drive of the people on this panel, we can explore more options and explore them in depth. And I want to thank all of them for their contribution to this important effort. Um, Dan, uh, 
it all right if I sit? I mean, yeah, we're, 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 we're among friends, some straight talk among friends here, uh, as I say. Uh, so, uh, Liz, uh, the distinguished Elizabeth Holtzman um, kind of stole my uh, intro there because I was going to claim to be the least knowledgeable. I still am going to claim it, and I don't think you're, uh, and people who know me, like uh, people I work with, like Mr. Cardozo, know that I'm not. Um, I, I generally speak with immodesty, so that's not false modesty here. This, I, I, uh, I definitely, I, I would like to yield as much of my time as I can to the people who, who really know this and do this day to day. Um, so I will try and very briefly, and I welcome uh, you, Mr. President. I see we've been joined by your very distinguished president. Yeah, yeah I, I should president have done Travis. that. Our pre president Jeremy Travis is right here in the front. Go right ahead. Yes. Uh, I, I, there were, uh, I, I noted there were four students who did not applaud. I will, uh, <laughs> I can identify them later on. Uh, so, uh, but I'll, I'll, let me make, if I can, a series of brief disconnected observations that may be of value um, to folks. Uh, I think that the reason that Dan uh, invited me to, to this panel was, as you said, uh, when I was in the city council, um, I sponsored a bill that the council passed, and for all I know is the only local uh, thing, uh, ordinance of, of that type, um, that uh, sought to, or purported to, sought to uh, impose a liability on gun dealers anywhere in the, in the, in the country um, if they sold a gun uh, that resulted in harm in New York City uh, unless they uh, adhered to a code of responsible conduct. So the whole purpose of it was to uh, try and simply impose on the gun uh, dealer industry uh, a code of responsible conduct uh, that if uh, you followed it, you would be immune from liability, and if you did not, you would be exposed to liability. That's really what the tort system does, right? All you know, in, in every uh, you know, in, in every facet uh, of the economy, that's what it tries to do. Uh, and the code of responsible conduct was quite simple. A gun dealer had to be a real thing, a real store. Uh, that with a physical location, uh, not somebody selling out of their uh, the trunk of their car, so that law enforcement could uh, would know where to go. Um, uh, they had to most important uh, sell only one gun to any individual in a month. Uh, that was really, I think, the the, the core of it, uh, because the our gun scourge here, as other folks can talk to talk to more. Uh, uh, with more numbers, um, uh, is fueled not by gun dealers in New York City or New York State even so much, but by um, illegal gun traffickers who buy guns uh, many at a time, either directly or through straw purchasers. Um, elsewhere, in places that don't have the tough laws New York does, it occurs to me people here may not, uh, you know, I shouldn't assume too much background, right, but New York State has a terrific regime of, uh, of gun laws. It's been recently strengthened some, but, uh, but even before that, if you want to own a firearm in New York State, uh, you have to get a license to do that. Uh, that means that the police will uh, do a background check and make sure that you are, uh, you know, nothing in your record that suggests you should not own a gun. Um, and you have to register that gun with New York State so that New York, there's a, uh, a record of who owns which guns. So uh, if a gun turns up in a uh, crime scene, the police can then go back and say, well, I know it was sold not just by this gun store, but to who, and they can follow the chain of command, uh, or the chain of possession, rather. So um, if every state had uh, laws like that, I think that New York um, would be a considerably safer place. And the whole purpose was to try and uh, go a little bit in that direction uh, for, in, for the rest of the country. So um, I'm proud to say that, uh, well, no, I'm, I'm chagrined, uh, but a little proud to say that um, shortly after we passed that here in New York, uh, Congress passed the uh, what protection of law, lawful uh, commerce. protection of lawful commerce in arms act. Uh, you know, not it's not a name worth remembering, so I shouldn't be embarrassed. I don't remember it, but um, that, as Dan said, purports to um, uh, immunize the gun industry from from lawsuits across the country, and that's what Congressman Schiff is, Schiff is hoping to uh, get, have repealed. And he sh and I I wish him all success. Um, my my couple of thoughts are. Uh, I think liability, I'm very, very pleased that, that you framed today's discussion on the liability topic because um, I think for those of us in the, the movement or people who, who do believe that we 
uh, can, that the government can and needs to and should do more to reduce gun violence. Um, there's always been two paths that you can go in this debate. One it, it kind of does focus on um, the, the firearm itself and, and kind of treats firearms as uh, dangerous, verging on, I, I'm going to, inflammatory word, evil products. And a lot of people feel that way. I think in New York City, probably most people feel that way, really. Um, it, was, it, it was a bit of an awakening for me when I went to work for uh, on the, the staff of the Judiciary Committee in the Congress and saw met people from all across the country who really did not feel that way at all. Um, and, and that prompted me to realize that there, there's an alternative way to frame the issue, which, uh, which is fine. We accept them as reasonable products that maybe somebody might want to own, um, but the goal of the government is to reduce the harm from them as much as possible. Uh, and, you know, I think that Jonathan can talk to this. They've, the Brady Organization and others in that mo in the movement, I think, have had uh, difficulty, re legitimate difficulty, over the years, to kind of deciding which is that um, the, the most powerful message. Because the guns are evil message kind of mobilizes the base, uh, but the hey, guns are fine. Uh, we just want to minimize the harm message um, has the ability to capture the center. And I guess we see that choice in all kinds of issues, but it, it, it exists in this issue, too. Um, the, li the liability approach, um, uh, I think, if you're, if you're taking that second tack, um, does it about as well as you can, um, and does it by utilizing the, the market incentives that uh, you know, we see are so powerful. If people realize that their money is at stake, uh, you know, then they will, uh, they'll do everything that they can to make sure that, they're, uh, that, that nobody uh, forced them to spend any of it. And uh, it, it's not, you know, it can be done through liability, it could be done through insurance, requirement that that gun uh, gun owners have insurance and gun dealers have insurance for the car for the I mean there has to be then liability at the back of that um, but the, the kind of basic idea that you should treat guns like cars uh, need a license to own to own one have to register it so the government knows where they are and you have to have insurance so that uh, if, if harm results uh, somebody's there to pay for it. Um, I think that's a powerful concept, and liability is one part of. Um, last couple of things, uh, drawing on, uh, before I was in the City Council, I did work on the staff of the Judiciary Committee in, in the House, and uh, this was the time when we passed the Brady Law uh, and the assault weapons ban, and uh, as, as Congress gets ready to tackle these issues again, uh, the, 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 there are, I think, a couple lessons to be drawn from those experiences. One is the importance of the police, and I really think that um, I, you would not have seen the Brady Law and assault weapons passed um, in the first place were it not for the active engagement of law enforcement um, ac across the country, not just NYPD, although, you know, nobody I think in the world has the authority of the uh, uh, chief of the NYPD. But, uh, but if you have sheriffs uh, in Oklahoma counties and um, North Carolina counties uh, telling their local members of Congress gun control helps reduce crime, that carries weight much more, you know, more than any uh, anybody from New York uh, is going to be able to do. Um, and I, th I think the um, law enforcement, the the engagement of law enforcement in that gun control fight had been nurtured over a period of years um, to, to I think to be effective in the, at, at the congressional level. That has to be done, uh, you know, again and kept uh, kept kept strong. Um, and, and the last thing is, even though this, all this talk about how powerful the NRA is and how it can't be beaten and how, you know, they're, um, it's just not true. Uh, first of all, you've got that historical evidence. And not that long ago, I went back to confirm that I was right, um, Al Gore in uh, 2000 um, ran on a platform of uh, national gun licensing and registration. That was in his platform as a presidential candidate in 2000, and he got more votes than, than George Bush, as is well known. So the, the notion that it's political suicide, um, I really think is belied by that. And that's why it's so great that you have uh, leaders like uh, Congressman Schiff who, uh, who see through the, uh, the NRA bluster and are willing to take the fight to them.
Uh, thank you, Dan, for including me. Thank you, David. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, one of my favorite schools in New York, and your president, uh, Jeremy Travis, sitting here, makes me a little nervous that he's looking at me. I'll try to do a good job. <laughs> um, this is a particularly auspicious day to be having this event, at least in my mind, because uh, earlier today I was privileged uh, to be in City Hall when uh, the Vice President of the United States arrived to meet with uh, Mayor Bloomberg, and they talked about the various legislative strategies <coughs> to pursue in Congress. Um, and after they met, they, uh, they met with uh, families of the victims of uh, Newtown, Connecticut. Um, and there was then a press conference where uh, the courageous families uh, talked about the, uh, their personal losses and the importance of doing something about this, which is what uh, the mayor and the vice president are dedicated to do. Um, and as I think most people in this room know, uh, the mayor has been a, a big public uh, supporter of major changes in the gun laws. Um, and I thought you might find, uh, find it helpful to talk about what is it in the in area, not legislation, and I certainly agree with uh, David and Liz uh, when we talk about the need for legislation, but what is it that can we do in the litigation context to hold gun manufacturers and gun dealers, the sellers of guns at the local level, what can we do to make them wake up and say, wow, if I don't pay attention and make sure that my guns are only sold to responsible people, I'm going to be liable. Because I'm sure there are many people in this room, and boy, it would be fun to have a, a nice, fancy car and it's all souped up. But if you knew that that car was not so, so safe, if you were uh, manufacturing the car, and that you'd be liable if that car had something wrong with it, you'd make sure your car didn't have that problem. That's what the basic concept of negligence is. Or if you were manufacturing some kind of uh, uh, device to, to make sure that there was not uh, a lot of weeds and grass, and so you sell it to gardeners who spray, spray things on the grass. Well, if that stuff that the gardeners spray on the grass pollutes the whole neighborhood and a lot of people get sick, you as the manufacturer of that gas are liable. And so you make sure that the gas doesn't have those products because you are on the hook. So what can we do in the litigation context to say gun manufacturers and gun dealers, if you don't pay attention to what you're doing, you're gonna pay through the nose. So what I, want, what I thought you would find interesting is two, if I tell just a minute, about two lawsuits that the city of New York brought to try to do just this, to hold the gun manufacturers and the gun dealers accountable. Because I think it, it's somewhat of a path to the future, but it also has some very practical limitations. So uh, when Mayor Giuliani was the mayor, the, this uh, lawsuit I'm about to describe was begun and was continued by, by uh, Mayor Bloomberg. And he sued the gun, some gun manufacturers. And he, he claimed that the gun manufacturers were negligent in the way they distributed their guns to dealers, and they had created what's called a public nuisance because they had sold these guns so irresponsibly that the general public was uh, at risk. And my colleague, Mr. Prashansky, who's sitting next to President Travis, uh, was about to go to trial on this case. It would have been a landmark case. And the United States Congress, uh, as we've heard, is somewhat susceptible to the pressures of the NRA. And so they passed, the Congress passed, uh, a law which uh, David had just referred to. Uh, uh, well, David uh, called it the Lawful Commerce in Arms Act, which I guess is the technical name. Uh, we call it the Protection of Legal Commerce in Arms Act, because what this outrageous law did is with one or two exceptions said, 
gun manufacturers and gun dealers cannot be held accountable in the way I suggested. So we uh, brought, had this case in Brooklyn, and we're about to go to trial, and Congress passes this law that seems to say you can't sue gun manufacturers. But there's an exception in the law, and it says you can sue gun manufacturers if you say that the gun manufacturer violated a federal or state law in the way they sold their guns. And so we said, well, the gun manufacturers had violated what's called the public nuisance law. Unfortunately, and then I, I most unfortunate is that I then took the case over and I lost in the appellate court in the Second Circuit because the appellate court interpreted the statute, we think, incorrectly, uh, but they said, no, you have to cite a specific statute that the gun manufacturers violated. And we hadn't cited a, speci a statute that specifically talks about guns in the language. And the, because the public nuisance and the uh, statutes don't use the word guns, we lost. There's an other cases that seem to, to point in the other direction. One case in, uh, in Buffalo we may hear more about that's going forward right now. So there's hope that you can sue gun manufacturers, but this statute stands in the way. But as you probably know, Mike Bloomberg doesn't like to give up. So we brought a new lawsuit. And this is one of the, fa I've been in charge of bringing a lot of lawsuits in the 12, 11 plus years I've been corporation counsel, and, and this is about, this is my favorite. So we had information, you can find out where illegal guns are sold, as, uh, as David uh, indicated, because when you recover a gun in New York and a crime, you, you can, by looking at the, inside the casing, you, there's a number and you can trace the gun back to where the gun was sold. So most guns that are used in crime in New York, um, as been said, don't come from New York gun dealers, they come from out of state gun dealers. So we identified about 24, 25 gun dealers in various states, South Carolina, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, I think it was, where a lot of illegal guns have been sold and ended up in New York. And this is what we did. We hired a private investigator, a man and a woman, and they went into these gun dealers, and the man was wearing a Yankee baseball cap, and inside the baseball cap was a video camera. And the man would go up to the counter in South Carolina and said, I wanna buy a gun, and they said, all right, I'll buy that gun. And the clerk would say, okay, just fill out this paperwork, because under federal law, you do have to fill out uh, to say you're over 21, you're not a felon, things like that. And the man would say, oh, I'll have my girlfriend fill out the paperwork and she would fill out the paperwork instead. That's an absolute violation of federal law. No question about it. That's what's called a straw purchase. And we have this now on videotape. I have them dead to rights. So what did we do? We had 24, 25 stores, and we brought a lawsuit. And we brought the lawsuit in New York, after all, Perhaps the jury in South Carolina or North Carolina might not be as sympathetic to our argument as the judge in New York. So we brought the case in federal court in New York. And these dealers decided, with two exceptions, they didn't want to fight the case. They gave up, and they agreed to a federal court order in which a federal monitor was appointed by the judge, a very well-known judge named Jack Weinstein, and he, those dealers were under the supervision of the federal monitor. They each had to post a bond for $25,000. The monitor could monitor their books, could make sure they were complying with federal law, that they were uh, had their uh, display cabinets appropriately secured, they didn't have any guns that were sold off and the result, 
The gun traffic out of those stores that we sued dropped 85%, the illegal gun traffic. And so there is a way to do that. However, and there's an important footnote, a couple of the dealers did not uh, settle, and they took, through a complicated process, they took an appeal to the appellate court and they said, New York City did not have the right to sue us in New York City. They had to sue us in South Carolina or North Carolina because we don't do any business in New York. And I, I won't bore you with the esoteric uh, arguments that, that uh, you could go into, but, on, but one of the judges, the only judge who really uh, wrote an opinion on this, said that the, plain, the defendant was right and next time that we would have to bring a case like that, we would have to bring the case in, in the home state of the dealer unless we could show that that gun dealer had really done a lot of business in New York as distinct from business in South Carolina that had an adverse effect in New York. So what do we make of all of this? First, that this uh, horrible statute makes it difficult but not impossible to sue gun manufacturers and gun dealers, but it's very esoteric discussion and, and uh, some very interesting uh, literature, uh, including a terrific article that John uh, uh, recently wrote about how you can get around this statute. Uh, but you need the wherewithal to bring these lawsuits. The City of New York uh, has perhaps the wherewithal. Not all governments do as a practical matter. And it is just a shame that we have to go to these uh, lengths to try to hold the gun manufacturers and dealers accountable. But that's the way to do it, and we should certainly do everything possible to continue to do it. Thank you very much. I don't know if Ms. Holt. Oh, sure. Um, I'm John Lowy, Director of the Legal Action Project at the Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence. Uh, I don't know if uh, Ms. Holtzman and I are the two trial lawyers in the bunch, which is why we feel comfortable standing up. But uh, I, I'm humbled to be uh, on this panel, um, but I feel that most of my thunder has been stolen by everybody else. So I, I will, I thought I would give you a few uh, examples of cases that uh, I have been involved in over the years to give you a, a window into how criminals actually get guns in this country and why gun companies should have to pay their fair share uh, when they are partly responsible for that. Uh, I have been a, an attorney with Brady Center for 16 years, many of it representing victims of gun violence uh, who have lost loved ones, uh, or have been wounded themselves from gun industry negligence. And let me give you some examples. Uh, we represented two New Jersey police officers a few years back, Ken McGuire and Dave Lemongello. And they were both shot. One of them was almost killed. Uh, in fact, he told me that when he was brought to the hospital and woke up, uh, the nurse told him, uh, you should be taking a dirt bath right now. And I, it took me a while to understand what that meant. Um, sounds like some of you do. Um, and the reason why uh, Ken and Dave were shot, the reason why the criminal who shot them got a gun was not th nothing because of uh, New Jersey's gun laws, which were uh, strong enough to uh, prevent this criminal from getting a gun. A gun trafficker went to West Virginia, 